Um, well, thank you so much for choosing to spend your evening here with us. It's really a, a great pleasure to have all of you here to the 160th in Greenwood and its Art Intersection Project Open House. My name is Allison Peters, and I work at a consulting firm named Enviro Issues. I'm going to facilitate our discussion this evening and introduce a couple of the speakers and help orient you to what you're observing and learning tonight. So again, thanks for coming. Um, tonight you're going to be hearing from several different individuals that have been intimately involved with this project to date. Um, Cheryl from Shoreline Community College is here to talk a little bit about the residential student housing projects that are happening here at the college. And both Trish and Natasha, um, just Trish, and uh, Kendra from the city of Shoreline are here to answer questions and talk more about the intersection improvements. I don't know that there's any elected officials here tonight. I do want to acknowledge uh, any who are here. Um, someone is here? Oh, okay. Um, so please do wave and let us know um, if you're here representing the city or any other uh, public entity tonight. Thanks so much for being here. Um, and there's many other team members who have worked with me and uh, my colleague Alex on the presentation tonight. Um, we are all here to help you, again, navigate what you're looking at and help you get your questions answered this evening. So everyone from the project team can just do a quick wave so that uh, guests know who you are. Um, we're all here to help. We have name tags on and, again, we're be kind of stationed around the room this evening to make sure that you're getting the most out of what you're seeing. Um, a few housekeeping things before we get started. There's um, a set of fact sheets that are right on the table as you signed in. So if you didn't have a chance to grab one, we can bring them in. And if you want to raise your hand, we'll make sure that everybody has one of those before we get started. Uh, the restrooms are around the corner of this room, um, almost directly uh, in front of me or to my side, both men and women. So please feel free to use what you need. Um, and then all of the exits, my understanding, um, are open and available in an emergency. I don't think any doors are locked in this building right now, so they'll all push out and there's multiple exits in front of us and in this room. Uh, a couple other things, too, that I want to point out. Um, there's a couple of comment boxes at the back of the room, and there are cards that if you would like to, or prefer to write out a question or a comment using the form and just dropping it in the box, for the city to take a look at later on. You're welcome to do that. We'll also have some time um, after the presentation for Q&A. So there's a couple of different ways that you can participate tonight. Wanted to just get you oriented to how we're going to be running this event this evening. Um, you've had some time to arrive, and hopefully you've had a chance to look at some of the boards and images uh, around the room. We're going to start with about a 10 to 15 minute presentation, and there'll be a couple of speakers walking us through new information. And that will be followed by about 15 minutes of Q&A. So um, there are some note cards around also for you to write your questions down. I know we're not a large group tonight, but in terms of everyone having an uh, equitable chance to have their question answered, the best way for us to manage that process is for you to actually write your question down I'll collect them, we'll take a look at what we have. Um, if there are duplicate questions, we'll probably just take the one. Uh, hopefully there's a pretty wide variety of issues or concerns or questions that you have that we'll have a chance to get to. We certainly can go over time a few minutes if we need to, so don't be shy about um, having questions and using multiple cards if you need to. Uh, if you do have multiple topics that you're interested in, it's helpful for them to each be on their own card so that I don't get a card with five questions on it. So just feel free to use what you have. We have pens around the room as well. Um, the purpose of our presentation tonight is really to give you a status update and orient you to the information and resources in the room. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit about where we are in the process to improve this intersection. And in terms of what feedback we are seeking from all of you here today and how the project team will be using your input, uh, there's a couple of different things that we're looking for. We're absolutely looking for your questions in the Q&A and what information might, might not be clear to you that we need to explain in more detail or explain in a different way. So your ability to and willingness to help us understand what your questions are is very important at this stage. Um, and then there's opportunities on a couple of the boards 
for you to actually give us some input on what is most important to you on a whole range of criteria that will be used to make decisions about this project in the future. So again, really leaning into information that you see here and giving us candid information as to what is important to you and your family or your household as you take a look at the project's uh, project options or the proposed intersection improvements ahead of you will be really helpful. Um, everything that you are also seeing in this PowerPoint presentation is on display around the room. So there are very few pieces of information or slides that aren't duplicated on boards. Um, but if, if something is hard to see or you'd like to go back to it after the Q&A is finished, we can get some of these slides back up on the board and or on the screen so you can go through information again. Um, we all we will also be recording um, this session so that you can watch it or go back to it later on. Uh, you can certainly tell neighbors um, or friends and family that didn't have a chance to come tonight uh, to come and use this information as a resource. So we'll make sure that you know where to go to get that information. Uh, and then finally, we'll have a, a summary of what we learned tonight and what we heard from you that will be available on the project website within the next few weeks. So there's lots of ways that you can stay updated and stay involved. Uh, again, just want to appreciate uh, your time and you being here tonight. I would like to turn the mic over to Cheryl from Troyline Community College. She's going to talk us through a little bit about what's happening on campus. Welcome to Shirley Community College. What a wonderful summer evening and a great opportunity for us to learn more about what's happening with the intersection. I always like to begin with the intersection predates the college. We've been here about 55 years. And uh, because we have a master's development plan, we are um, required to do some uh, improvements. And so I wanted to share a little bit about that. Before I do, we have some esteemed people here this evening. I want to begin with one of our board members, uh, Gidget. Who is uh, revisiting us again? She completed a 10 year uh, appointee um, from the governor on our board, and now she's filling in for a uh, position, and we're looking forward to bringing someone new on. But right now, we're so pleased that you're here, and so good to thank you for coming tonight. She's also lives in our community as well. Um, we have some of our employees here. We have a new vice president for student learning, Philip King. Mr. King, he's here and uh, learning more about our engagement. And then um, Mary Brigman, who's our Vice President for Advancement and our Executive Director of our Foundation. So she uh, really helps us connect with our community. That's her biggest piece of her work as well. And with Spectrum, who has been such a help with us, uh, Spectrum Limited um, LLC, they've been our project manager on our residence hall. So we are getting ready for leasing very avidly and it's going to open fall of 2019. So um, some of the things that you've been seeing are uh, frontage improvements that are part of our master development plan and so uh, new uh, driveways and roadways and uh, better uh, passage on 160 and all the way up. So we're really pleased that work is going to be completed in early September so that we can open up our building. So we're really pleased about that. So that's kind of our team. So as I mentioned, we have a master development plan that um, we entered in with the city and there are certain requirements that we have to do. And so when we complete this project, um, as I said, you're seeing the frontage improvements, there's going to be another piece. Once we have occupancy of that building, it's going to trigger us looking at the traffic mitigation at that intersection of 160th and Arden and Greenwood. It's a very unusual, very unique intersection um, and so we are so pleased that you've had a chance to look at the different options. Honestly, we're a little agnostic to that. We don't really have a, a preference to uh, the solution. We want to have a solution. Um, we have about 10,000 students who come to Charlotte every year, and we'd like to make it a, a, a more easy opportunity for them, but also for our residents who, who uh, go through those um, um, that intersection every day and live through it uh, longer than our students. Well, I guess our new residents Um, the other thing I would just say around um, the construction of the uh, traffic mitigation is the college will, depending on the solution, will be the primary funder for it. So that's really where we get involved, um, whether it's the roundabout or the signalization. So um, we are interested in that in that way, and um, we've been 
great partner with the city. They've been really coming alongside us. We have um, jointly put together these presentations for our community, and um, they've been very supportive of the college as we move forward to, as I said, make this a great place to live, learn, work, and play. As I said, we've been over 55 years, and we also want to make this a, a better um, opportunity for flow of traffic for everyone who is part of this neighborhood. So with that, I think that's all my slides, and I'm going to advance it, and we're going to start to hear more about what's um, that's options and the solution. Good evening. Um, I'm Trisha Yilke, and I'm the city engineer at the city of Shoreline. And so I'm going to walk through this presentation a little bit more about what we're doing and a little bit more specifics. And first, I really want to echo what Cheryl said about this being a very collaborative process that we're in with the community college, and that community feedback and input is really important to us, uh, and that is why we're here tonight. You can see on this kind of where we're at in this process with this star. Uh, as Cheryl mentioned, this really was identified as a need through their master plan development. Um, typically, when we have a development, if they need to do improvements, then they would just go off and do them. But we recognize the uniqueness of this intersection, so the city has been engaging in this process with the community college to really look, what are our options out here? And so we've started this in the spring, and uh, in May we had a public meeting in here. Maybe some of you were here as well. That's the first place that we were at had a meeting out here, and then today we're here. And so what we've really been trying to do is come up with what's a concept plan. What would work out here in this intersection is going to mitigate the traffic congestion and improve safety. And so we really got down to comparing a signal with a roundabout. And our plan here tonight is to give you a little bit of explanation about what's the difference between those two, what we're seeing as far as the analysis, and then again, get your feedback on what, what you think about the two alternatives, what's important to you relative to your priorities. And then we're going to take that feedback along with some additional technical analysis and traffic analysis and work with the college to come up with a preferred alternative, a preferred alternative or concept uh, in September of this year. And then after that, it'll go into design. And as Cheryl said, construction doesn't need to be completed until 2025. So we may not see a whole lot of development and design for a little while, so we're very early in this process. Um, we will do our best to keep people informed as we go along, but it will take some time. Uh, this isn't something where you're going to see construction happen next year or even the year after, so we have some time to work on this. And so I probably don't need to tell most of you what's unique and challenging about this intersection, since most of you probably go through here regularly. Uh, but what we do know is that we have some poor sight lines, and we've got multiple entry points, right? You've got like five points here on this intersection. You can't always see who's where. Um, we've got delays, meaning that you're sitting at the, at the stop sign waiting and trying to figure out when your turn to go is and waiting for other people. So we've got those sorts of delays. We've got poor access for bikes and pedestrians. It doesn't always feel very safe out here, if you're, uh, whether you're in a car or out of a car. Uh, it doesn't feel very safe. And then it's also used by buses, and it serves not only the community college, but also serves an elementary school, all of which adds to the complexity of this uh, intersection. But I will say that while everybody's uncomfortable with this intersection, what's interesting is because of that uncomfort, or that discomfort, we really don't have a lot of accidents. So both from a vehicle, vehicular perspective and from a pedestrian perspective, we don't have the data that shows that there's a lot of accidents. I think that's because people are really uncomfortable, so they drive really slow, and they're very cautious if they're trying to cross the, cross the street. Um, so that just adds to, I'm sure there are many near misses, though, that you can all recognize and experience. So again, we were here in May, and I want to go a little bit about uh, what we heard in May. We heard the community talk about the congestion and concern about that congestion in the intersection on a regular basis. We definitely heard about concerns for pedestrian safety and not feeling safe to cross the street in, in many directions. Uh, we heard concerns about the delay, that people would like to see these improvements happen sooner rather than later and not necessarily wanting to wait until 2025. 
Uh, and then we heard we heard that people were interested and favorable about a roundabout, and we also heard people that were maybe a little bit more skeptical or uncomfortable with the roundabout because it's relatively new. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the timeline. So we've taken that information into account, and then we've moved on to these next steps um, to try and move forward with our uh, concept plan. When we were here in May, also, we had three options. We had a large roundabout, and we had a small roundabout, and we had the signal. So based on some of the comments we had in the last meeting, we helped narrow this down to one roundabout option and one signal so that we can do a better comparison and not keep our, you know, limit how much analysis we're doing. Uh, so we had the large roundabout and the small roundabout, and again, our first task after that meeting was to narrow it down to one of those options. And we just went with the uh, small roundabout as, uh, as our as our concept to move forward. Both alternatives worked. They both met the needs as far as improving traffic congestion. They both met the needs as far as improving the pedestrian and bicycle experience. But we chose to move forward with the roundabout because it has a somewhat lower construction cost. Uh, it also has a smaller travel path and so a little bit shorter type time in your vehicle to get around the roundabout. Uh, and then it also created some additional green space that could be used for other purposes. Uh, and then, on, but on the downside, it does require a little bit more right of way uh, that needs to be purchased as well. So once we removed the, the large roundabout and just focused on the small roundabout, we were left with these two concepts. And I'm going to share with you a little bit about these these options. And you can look at a more detail on the boards. They're both they're on boards in the back, and then they're also on the maps that are laying on the tables on the back. So hopefully, you can find plenty of ways to look at these options. Again, as we did the analysis, again, both of these options work. They both meet our standards for congestion and accommodate the growth of the community college. Uh, they both can be ADA compliant and meet pedestrian needs, uh, and both can accommodate bikes. So we're trying to figure out which one works better, and we have a little bit more analysis to do on that, and including we've looked at costs, both construction costs and the cost of maintenance and operations of the facilities. Uh, and then we've also looked at the extents of impacts of right-of-way limits, which means do we need to purchase property in order to fit the improvements in there. Um, and then also trying to get that community priorities and community feedback. So a couple of things to point out about the roundabout concept and option is it does have the operational efficiencies and has some safety benefits. Um, there's opportunities for some public art or place making in that central that center area. It's a little bit glare on there, I apologize. It creates this green area that could be used for something. Um, it reduces the travel paths. I can't really make my pointer work. Um, and it can accommodate buses. Well, it needs to accommodate buses, but it accommodates both buses and emergency vehicles. Uh, and then we would also utilize pedestrian activated beacons to improve the pedestrian safety. Uh, it does require some property acquisition. You know, specifically, there's a little corner here that's part of the school district's property that we would need to acquire in order to make this work. The signalized intersection uh, requires two signals. So you need a signal here to control this intersection and a signal here to control this intersection. It makes it complex to make those two to work in tandem and actually get uh, maximize the congestion and the traffic benefits on that. Uh, and because they're new signals, that does increase our operations and maintenance costs because we currently don't have the cost of maintaining a signal. It does accommodate buses and it does uh, and emergency vehicles and it does facilitate the pedestrian crossings uh, with push buttons for people to cross at these crosswalks. But as we move forward, we're trying to distinguish between these and which one we feel is a, is a, a preferred option. Uh, we've established some criteria to evaluate, and much of this was, dis was discussed at the last meeting. Uh, and so we're going to look at how uh, each option impacts traffic operations and traffic flow. Uh, this means like how long does it take you to get through the intersection? What's your delay? That's how we, that's how we measure uh, traffic operations. And then what are the safeties for all users, uh, including ADA compliance, including people walking and bicycles? Uh, we're gonna look at costs for construction. 
Uh, that includes both the actual cost for construction and then long-term costs for operations and maintenance. And uh, right-of-way acquisition feeds into the costs as well. Uh, and then we're also looking at the environmental impacts. Uh, what are the impacts to, say, removal of trees, creation of additional green space, uh, impacts to um, vehicle emissions, greenhouse gases, other environmental considerations like that is on our criteria. Uh, and then community feedback and what we hear from you is important to us and will help us shape our preferred option. Uh, and then the other piece is what are the impacts to other infrastructure out there? You've heard and you've seen that the college is building some uh, sidewalks um, that will serve here from the campus down to 160th and down to Dayton. Uh, some of those with either option will need to be removed in order to accommodate these. And so we're looking at which one has the you know, least amount of impacts to that existing infrastructure. That's one of our criteria as well. And so with that, I'll get a little bit to the results of what we've seen. What we've seen. And the driver for this project really has been around traffic congestion. That is what has triggered the need for the college to do these improvements. Uh, and so what we're seeing from our preliminary modeling is again, both intersections work. You can see there on the left, oops, on the left. This is the delay you experience in the current uh, intersection. Those are all in seconds. If we put in around a signal, you can see that the uh, congestion goes down. It takes you less time to get through that intersection. But if you, and if you have a roundabout, it takes even less time to get through this intersection. Uh, these are all just, uh, preliminary, we're still refining them, but we use these tonight to show existing. This is what you would see, the difference if that was, if we could snap our fingers and we had this out here today under today's traffic environment, this is what you would see as different. And you can see that the roundabout performs better in all times of the day. Uh, this intersection out here is somewhat unique than other intersections that have such a midday uh, impact, right? That's really the one that, that performs the least, and that's usually not what we see uh, but it's the unique nature of the college and, and the, the enrollment and the, the when classes are released and when students leave. So we're looking into those. And then again, we've taken this as kind of the scorecard of what we, what we put as those evaluation criteria and started to compare them. And this is on a board back here as well. Might be a little bit washed out with the, um, with the sun, the glare on there. Um, so on the round, when we look at construction costs, the roundabout is slightly more expensive than the signal. When we look at operations and maintenance, the roundabout really has limited costs, but there's more significant costs for the signal. When it comes to right-of-way costs, it's moderate for the roundabout, but there's no right-of-way costs with the signal. On safety, we see a significant improvement with the roundabout, uh, and on the signal, we do still see an improvement. From a traffic flow perspective, we have a moderate improvement, and from a signal, we have a small improvement. From an inter environmental impact, we have a minimal amount of impact with the roundabout and a moderate impact with the signalized intersection. And then looking at the impacts to those current improvements, the roundabout will require more of those sidewalk improvements to be removed and reconstructed, and the signal will have some but less impact. Uh, and that, again, is on the board back there. And this is some of what we want to get your feedback on relative to what's important to you as we weigh uh, our alternatives in these concepts. Can you talk a little about the environmental impacts? Because I, I see more with the roundabout with trees coming down and stuff and the same infrastructures for the signal. So what was that? So a couple of the, some of the details on the differences on these is the roundabout does require more trees to come down. I think our preliminary count is five trees would have to come down for the roundabout and on the signal it's one tree. Uh, the advantages of the roundabout is that you get you get that green space that I mentioned previously uh, that can create some extra green space, uh, which is and more plantings and more trees can be replaced in here. Uh, roundabouts typically have a better, uh, less cars idling, better for your greenhouse gases, carbon emissions from your vehicles, with less travel time, less delay, less idling. So there's trade-offs for both of them. Uh, those are the, the ones that we, what we saw as we looked at Yes, part of that. The signals, Kendra said that the signals also have an electrical cost associated with them that the roundabout does not. 
And recognizing that um, roundabouts are relatively new, and those of you that were here last time, you've seen some of this already, we kind of wanted to walk through a little bit about the pros and cons of a signal versus an intersection. And so the, that's what I have here in these next couple of slides. Um, the signalized information, both of these information, first of all, report from, from some pretty standard peer reviews, and what's the difference in the comparison. Um, and the idea isn't to necessarily make a case for one or the other, but to make sure that you understand the differences between these. And then because they're relatively new and, and we're still learning about them. So the signals, the typical pros is the positives on them is that people are comfortable with them. We drive through traffic signals on a regular basis. We know how to behave, we know where to stop, we know how to wait for, for red lights and turn you know, and make our movements when there's green lights. Um, it's orderly, everybody has a turn, everybody knows when to go. Uh, this one's a little bit unique in that the signal's complex. Uh, so with those two intersections, it's going to require a little bit of a different behavior than what you would typically have with your intersection or with a signal. Um, and then people, pedestrians clearly know when to go. They've got the walk sign, they've got the don't walk sign, and they know how to behave on those. The cons for signals is that they have a, they have a higher maintenance cost. Um, if there's a power outage, then they don't work. Um, and they can cause delay for people that walking or vehicles just during off-peak times. So the signal's always working, so you have to wait for your turn regardless of if there's any other traffic or not. Uh, and then there's more conflict points, and I'll show you a, a graphic about that. There's more conflict points. There's more ways for you to get to a crash or to con uh, collision with either another car or with people. There's more places to pay attention uh, to eliminate those conflicts. And on a roundabout, the typical pros are, and they reduce the opposite, is they reduce delay for when people are like walking or biking because you can see what's going on. You don't have to wait for a signal to tell you when to go or to make sure it's safe when you go. So that's helpful, particularly at non-peak hours. Uh, it's, it reduces air and noise pollution and fuel usage because you're not stopping and, you, uh, and not idling. It has lower maintenance costs, particularly relative to a signal. Uh, and then it improves safety for all users. There's a lot of data that supports a 90, this increase in safety. It has a 90% reduction in fatalities, 76% uh, reduction in injuries, and a 35% reduction in all crashes. Uh, the cons that people typically see is that they find it uncomfortable because they don't, they don't know when, to, they don't have a signal telling them when to stop, when to cross, when to stop. Um, so they're not quite comfortable. Drivers aren't as familiar with this since we don't have as many of them in this region. Uh, so they have, to re they have to relearn how to drive through a roundabout. Um, they can require more space in order to get that center island. They do take up a little bit more real estate. Uh, and they can be more complicated relative to construction and trying to phase to keep the signal operating while you're in construction. And a little bit of information because of that uh, discomfort for pedestrians in particular. This is one treatment that you can use, these rapid flashing beacons. Uh, that warn cars coming on that there's pedestrians that are coming or that are in that intersection. Pedestrians know there's some level of protection, uh, even though it's not regulated by a natural stop, a hand, a lock, or a stop sign. Uh, but it does provide protections. Uh, we would anticipate incorporating these into the design. And then some information about uh, the, the collisions and conflict points. Uh, so for vehicles and pedestrians, you can see the image on the left, there's very few conflict points when you're in a roundabout. You know what's coming, you can see what's coming, uh, you're really only looking one direction because traffic is, is moving in the same direction. As opposed to over here, if you're a pedestrian, you're trying to cross here, you're looking for who's coming straight, you're looking for who's turning right. Uh, there's a lot more opportunities for these conflicts between turning movements and pedestrians in the crosswalk. Similarly, for vehicles, you can see a lot more conflict points in a signalized intersection versus in a roundabout. People, again, are moving in and out at the same time. You don't have to worry about people running a red light well, um, and crashing through the intersection. And so, that brings us to our next steps for tonight. Again, we want to listen to your feedback and get input from the community. Um, and then we're going to also be looking at our technical information, particularly our traffic models, uh, and calibrating those and comparing which one, you know, how they work in comparison with one another. 
uh, refining our construction costs. And then we're going to work closely with the college to really identify what's a solution that we, uh, with the input of the community and the input of the college and the input of the city, what's a solution that we feel can best serve the community needs. Uh, and we will come up with this preferred concept in September, October of this year. And uh, we will share that information, not necessarily through a public meeting. You'll be able to find information on our website. We'll be able to share information through the neighborhood groups um, and a variety of other methods. Uh, but it may be a while before we come back out with another public meeting until we get farther into design. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Allison for some Q&A.